You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. But it's very interesting because we only live through a couple of these cycles in our lifetime. And if you can catch a couple of them properly, it's really amazing. The last time we had this cycle low in 2000, gold rallied from like 260 to $2,000. I mean, you're looking at like, you know, 18 times your money somewhere in there. And, uh, and we had a little financial crisis that helped give it a little bit of boot. Well, this time we have a global financial crisis and the commodity sector is bottoming. So, I mean, looking forward five to eight years from now, which is my kind of projection, huge money is going to be made in the commodity sector. Commodity prices could go through the roof, more specifically metals, gold, silver, because they are seen as an asset. We're having a credit crisis. We're having currency crisis. I mean, printing galore. So it's, there's some really exciting stuff coming together here that could change your life if you, if you trade it or invest properly. Welcome back into Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. Thanks for tuning in. Today's show is brought to you by Fury Gold Mines. The ticker symbol next week will be F. URY on the big boards in New York and Toronto. This will be the resultant company from Oren Resources acquisition of East Main Resources, and it will be a Canada focused premier explorer and developer with 50,000 meters of drilling at the Eau Claire project in Quebec beginning in about three weeks from now. So to learn more, go to furygoldmines.com and the ticker symbol next week, it'll begin trading under the symbol F-U-R-Y. Why? My guest today is Chris Vermeulen of the TechnicalTraders.com, a returning guest, very popular, knowledgeable regarding the markets and trading techniques. So Chris, welcome back onto Mining Stock Education. Since we focus on mining stocks, perhaps you could begin by giving us your analysis of GDXJ. What do you see going on here with the price action? Sure. Well, thanks for having me on the show, Bill. Uh, yeah, looking at GDXJ, both GDXJ and uh, Silver Miners and the GDX, really, across the board, they have very similar analysis, which is when you look at the daily chart over the past couple of months, they are making a series of lower highs and lower lows. So they are technically, uh, from a swing trader standpoint, which is, uh, you know, one to 30, 60 days, they are in a downtrend. And really, they're not they're, they're trying to find a bottom, but they're definitely not in favor. If you're buying here, you're you're buying a dip, hoping it's going there's the bottoms put in. It's really tough to pick bottoms. But um, I still think there could be a little bit of weakness in the market for the precious metals simply because October is a volatile month, especially during the election year cycle. If, if you actually look at the um, seasonality of how October moves during an election year, this is going back, uh, I think, 30 years from, I think, equity clock. It's a pretty choppy month. And we've seen that. We've seen these big up and down days on the SP 500, the NASDAQ, you know, up one and a half or two percent, down one and a half. And we've been flipping around. But looks like we're getting some traction. Hopefully the markets will move higher because if they do, they're going to pull the stock market or sorry, the gold miners GDXJ up with it. So we're in an election season, of course, as you've studied past election seasons, U.S. elections, that is presidential elections. What are some of the cycles or things that typically occur during this season? Right. So if you if you look at how the stock market moves the year before an election year, so last year, it's amazing. It, the average return is something like 22 percent or something like that is the is the average very strong year. And that's what we saw last year. Last year, I think SP 500 rallied like 23 or 28 uh, percent. An election year like we're in right now is typically a positive year. But we do get into selling mid-September and it usually bottoms out right at the end of October, which we're, we're slowly getting there. And then uh, and then actually what we're looking for next year come January is actually going to be a pretty rough year. It shows um, the first quarter of the year is very, very scattered. It's all over the place. And I think um, that's probably what we're going to run into, I think, this year or next year as well. Is I think we're going to follow the seasonality and um, we're going to see a lot of volatility. And it's it's not going to just be like a buy and hold scenario. It's going to be big waves of selling, big waves of uh, buying. As stimulus plans come out, as uh, Trump gets reelected and applies new things or a new uh, president comes in and changes things up. I mean, 
uh, you go back in time, I mean, we're going for a pretty rough ride over the next, I would say, five months. So what is your strategy to profit off of this volatility? So the real key is to focus on like leading sectors, like the best asset now, a band strategy uh, that I've, I've kind of developed. And more or less, you've got to find where these hot pockets are. For the last, for all of this year, the stock market's been very mixed. You look at the Dow, you look at the S, uh, the NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange, the Russell, they're all, they haven't made higher highs. They're actually showing signs that we're in the verge of starting a bear market. But when you look at the SP500 and the NASDAQ, which are heavy weighted in a, in a few key sectors like technology and biotech, healthcare, those are really pulling the markets up. So going forward, you need to focus on the hot sectors because they are leading the way. And I actually was talking about um, a couple of interesting sectors yesterday, which uh, is the energy sector. And believe it or not, if you look at clean energy, like the TAN ETF, T-A-N, that stands for that's the solar sector. And then there's another one uh, for clean energy. They're both up over 200% since the March lows. And, and that's clean energy. And there was, there was some news that came out saying the United States is using more electricity, supposedly, or it's forecasted to use a lot more electricity uh, going forward here. Now that everyone's working from home and everyone's got their own independent little offices, no shared spaces. And I think that could be a big reason why we're seeing solar and clean energy really take off. And the other end of the spectrum, we've got dirty energy, uranium ETF, URA, and the energy sector, which is mainly weighted with crude oil. I consider those dirty energy, and they're the worst performing on the year. So it's really interesting when you clear away the cobwebs and all the noise going on in this market. It's really, it's like clean energy is leading the way. Dirty energy is underperforming. Obviously, there's not much demand for dirty energy crude oil if everyone's staying home and transportation's pretty much in lockdown or very it's just limping along so there's some pretty interesting uh sectors out there that are uh, starting to come to life right now like home builders and the utilities are actually picking up speed so it's all about finding the hot sectors getting in them and then trying to uh, ride them out until there's more signs that the market could correct because statistically wise uh, sectors that have been outperforming for three or more months, there there's about a 70% probability they will continue to outperform looking forward like another 30 days. So you, the odds are definitely in your favor to stick with the leaders. And you do need to filter them out, find out which ones have the best chart patterns, which ones maybe aren't quite overextended. Um, some of them have had very strong runs and they're actually ready for a pause or pullback before they go higher. What's your perspective on oil? I interviewed uh, earlier this week a fund manager and half of his fund is in oil-related investments. He's very bullish on oil, especially over the next six months. He believes that oil will outperform gold. Uh, please share with us your take. Okay, so I think I have like the 180 view on that. Okay. <laughs> I, I, just, uh, I, I just don't see that happening. I mean, the only way I think oil is really going to take off is if we can clear the air of COVID and we don't have a, a second wave that's, that really grabs hold. And it's not just in the States, though. We need COVID to kind of be negated worldwide because oil is a global commodity. And in Europe, I mean, COVID's picking up. And the fact that there's over three years worth of storage of, of crude oil, I mean, you name it, every barrel, every underground uh, storage tank and ponds are, are full of oil and they still keep producing it. And um, I just don't see there being enough demand, I mean, to, for, for it to, to rocket higher. I, I don't see the, the upside in crude. Now, with that said, crude will bottom before the demand changes. The stock market typically leads the economic cycle. But I don't really see us uh, being there yet. What percentage cash are you holding in your portfolio right now? In the long-term portfolio, like investing, we're 30% cash. And then we hold, hold a basket of the equities because the stock market is still in a, in a bull market. And we're also moved 10% um, uh, into precious metals. Um, I, I still, I think there's a lot of risk going forward. I think holding some cash is critical. It's not about trying to maximize gains, especially during a time like this when we've got Trump on Twitter, uh, on, on Twitter. We've got uh, the elections just around the corner. We got stimulus being almost approved and then canceled, and then uh, a piecemeal one thrown together the next day. I mean, we're walking through landmines, and um, I think at any point here. 
the financial system, the global market is stretched to an extreme and something eventually is going to break. I, I think we already know a lot of things are kind of broken, but something really big, some event of some type is going to cause a huge move in the markets, whether it turns into a massive super cycle bull market for metals or for the stock market, or we have a huge collapse in the financial system. I'm not sure yet, but it is lingering there and you don't want to be caught on the wrong side because um, the CME just raised actually their circuit breaker limits, which to me is completely backwards. I think they went from a 5% circuit breaker limit. So if the stock market drops 5%, they halt trading. Well, they just opened it up to seven or seven and a half percent. So they're making it, I think they see volatility coming and they don't want circuit breakers to get tripped repeatedly throughout the day, kind of like what we saw in March because it, it, it creates fear. So they're opening up the range so it doesn't get hit as much. And on top of that, the same week, we saw interactive brokers tighten their margin requirements, meaning people uh, need more cash in their account to hold the same amount of stocks. And after IB issued that, the next day when it was implemented, we saw the stock market fall 2.5%, uh, meaning, and they're a huge institution. They're institutional money, their uh, retail clients are massive. And I think a lot of people got squeezed and were forced to liquidate positions and uh, these big institutions, they see volatility coming. They see trouble. So we're starting to see these institutions put protective things into place to hopefully not panic people and to protect people's accounts. Thank you for bringing that up about interactive brokers because I do have a margin account with them. And on September 22nd, I received that email to where they were <laughs> going to raise, increase my margin requirements by as much as 35% above the normal margin requirements leading up to the November U.S. elections, everything we've been talking about. So they see extreme volatility and they say they're doing this to protect themselves and their customers. Well, uh, regarding commodities... Outside of just mined commodities, any soft commodities that have your attention that you think might be primed for an uptrend? I mean, there's there's, a, there's some other commodities that I don't follow them too closely. I, I'm I'm uh, working on a presentation on um, this uh, commodity super cycle coming into play. And if you look at a hundred years, you go back a hundred years and you look at the value between um, the SP 500 or the Dow and commodity prices, we are at an extreme we've only seen three times before where commodities in general are way underpriced. And the last time we saw this was the 2000 tech bubble. Everyone piled into stocks, everyone wanted technology, and uh, not just precious metals, but like commodities in general were way out of favor. And so we're back at those really extreme levels. We're actually more extreme than we were um, in 2000. So it's really interesting that we've got this big cycle. It comes every about 16 years or so. And, um, I think we're on the verge of seeing a lot of commodities uh, move higher. I think coffee and cotton, a lot of a lot of com major commodities are trading down at you know twenty year lows. Uh, they've just been out of favor. Sugar, a, lo a lot of different commodities, and and when you look at the whole basket of them, this this chart, this kind of hundred year cycle chart shows that. So I think we're going to have eventually a big change in tide in these markets where everyone right now is hungry for technology stocks, buying equities left, right, and center. But it'll eventually fizzle out and the rise of commodities will come into play again and uh, equities will fall out of favor. But this is a, these are major cycles. This may not fully unfold these trends for another two or three years. But it's very interesting because we only live through a couple of these cycles in our lifetime. And if you can catch a couple of them properly, it's really amazing. The last time we had this cycle low in 2000, Gold rallied from like 260 to 2,000 dollars. I mean, you're looking at like you know 18 times your money somewhere in there, and uh, and we had a little financial crisis that helped give it a little bit of boot. Well, this time we have a global financial crisis, and the commodity sector is bottoming. So, I mean, looking forward five to eight years from now, which is my kind of projection, huge money is going to be made in the commodity sector. Commodity prices could go through the roof. More specifically, metals, gold, silver because they are seen as an asset. We're having a credit crisis. We're having currency crisis. I mean, printing galore. So it's, there's some really exciting stuff coming together here that could change your life if you, if you trade it or invest properly. I agree. And that's why I got into mining stocks, because you can create wealth if you do it right. 
quicker mm-hmm. than just 5% annualized returns. You can, like you said, over a 10-year period from 2000 to 2012, if you were in the gold stocks, those are truly life-changing gains that you can make over the course of a decade. And I've had previous yeah. guests uh, bring up that too, that there's uh, numerous voices that are are saying that we, we are at this uh, cyclical bottom for commodities that will be quite a nice ride. Well, when you survey the globe, uh, what are some of the major indexes indices across the globe that perhaps could be a good buying opportunity? Believe it or not, I haven't really been looking outside the globe too much. I mean, I, I looked across all the major markets. Uh, I mean, the Nikkei actually is kind of the next strongest that I like, uh, the Japanese market. Um, but other than that, I mean, the rest of the markets have been struggling. They're barely up. You look at the Euro, Euro stocks in general, they're way off their highs from 20 years ago. I mean, it's been dead money for over 20 years and you're still down big time. And that's that's why we're seeing the US dollar over the last year really shine because people around the world, global investors are saying, hey, the US stock market is through the roof. It keeps going higher and higher. Plus the dollar is rising. So they take all their other currencies, they throw them in, they buy US dollars, drive the dollar up and they move into US stocks. So they've got two things going in their favor. Maybe not recently with the dollar pulling back, but longer term, I mean, they're in a strong currency and they're in the strongest stock market. And that falls down to the band strategy. You want to be in the strongest sector, the strongest stock market. So that's why the U.S. market just keeps going up and up and up because it's getting everyone's money from around the world. So is the key here to see the dollar roll over before there'll be better opportunities outside the U.S.? Yeah, possibly. But I mean, a lot of people, I mean, I think there's record short positions on the U.S. dollar right now. And that to me is actually a bullish sign. And I think most people I talk to, they all think the U.S. dollar is going to get completely annihilated. Uh, all the stimulus is going to kill it. But the reality is, the markets are, are free moving in terms of it goes by people's beliefs, their their confidence in something, and people keep moving to the dollar. And the dollar could actually rally, I, I think, still substantially. And we could see a rally even with precious metals. I think they they are going to be too somewhat safe haven plays going forward. But um, if the U.S. dollar does start to tank and, and collapse in value, then I think we'll we'll see people maybe move away from it. But if the stock market is performing, outperforming the falling dollar, it's going to counter it and then some. So it's still going to be seen as a better asset class uh, currency. Chris, before you go, uh, what was your best trade this year so far? I think the best trade would have been bonds, uh, TLT ETF. We got into it in January when uh, it broke out of a multi-month bull flag pattern. And based on uh, market sentiment, we use a bunch of different risk ratios and performance of different sectors and asset classes. Uh, Bonds just gave us the signal saying, hey, huge money is starting to move into bonds. It has a a multi-month pattern. That means it should run for several months. And um, I mean, we were getting a little nervous that the stock market was going to have some type of big correction. And so we got into bonds and we caught about a 21% move in the bond market. And... um, yeah, it was that was the best trade of the year. And then we moved to cash and we completely sidestepped the entire market crash. So and also at the same time of bonds, we were actually long GDXJ and we caught a beautiful move in that. We actually exited the day it topped. It opened and gapped higher above our target. We got out and then it fell 57 percent. It was so both of those trades just happened to be like perfectly timed and allow us to sidestep this entire market crash. Uh, So those, yeah, there's two of them there that really played together. To learn more about Chris and his services, head on over to thetechnicaltraders.com, and I will also put a link to that in the show notes. Chris, really appreciate you coming on today's show. Thanks for your insights. Hey, thanks, Bill. Always a pleasure. 